Um, this talk um, is about knots and about knotted vortices. And um, uh, I think you'll see that it is more or less self-contained uh, and I'll build up the mathematics I'm using as I go along. Uh, this first slide uh, contains an interesting woodcut by uh, Moritz Escher, and it doesn't have that much to do with the talk, but, uh, but I thought I might draw your attention to it before I go on to the next slide, because you see it's a three half twisted Mobius band that has been cut down the middle. And um, some people are aware of this and some are not. Escher was aware of it, that he can get a trefoil knot to happen by taking a three half twisted Mobius band and cutting it down the middle. And that's what you're seeing here. You see a trefoil knot, but if you were to actually make a strip of paper and put three half twists in it and cut it down the middle, then uh, a truffle knot would magically appear. That's worth doing the experiment. Um, as I said, I wanted to be self-contained for a while, so um, we should remind ourselves that the question for the knot theorist about uh, a, uh, a tube in space or, or a curve in space is, is it knotted? Which would mean, can you deform it in such a way that it's just simply a circle. And uh, uh, I uh, give you this as a problem for this uh, particular slide, whether or not it's knotted or not. Um, and there are many different forms of knots depending on the physical materials in which they're embossed. Where abstractly a knot is just a curve in space taken topologically and doesn't have any thickness. But you see that there are lots of choices for materials and even how you might specifically make a knot, such as this uh, one here, which is made out of straight um, struts. Uh, and, um, and there are many questions that you can ask about such constructions. Um, but there are also very simple phenomena that are quite mysterious nonetheless, such as the phenomena of linking of curves that you see here. Um, and, and the phenomena of linking of curves is not as simple as it might have seemed when you're looking back at this one, where you obviously can count the number of times that one curve goes around another, and that will turn into an invariant, that will turn into something that has actual topological information. But you can have curves like the Borromean rings, where if you remove one of them, it falls apart, but you need all three of them to keep them together. So there's something mysterious about linking and knotting is a kind of self-linking. Here's the trefoil knot. And maybe I want to talk about this picture, although I won't go into the details of this kind of construction, but I'm showing you actually a coloring of this trefoil knot, which can be used, if you think about the combinatorics of this coloring, to prove that it's knotted. What you're seeing here is that the knot, um, I'm wondering whether I get a, I'm sorry, excuse me. Whoop. Uh, I thought I had a pointer that I was using and I'm not seeing it happening. So I won't, I'll just talk. Um, if you walk around this knot, you see that you go, it, it's composed of three continuous arcs that break uh, in the picture as they go under. And uh, the three arcs are colored red, blue, and green. And at a given crossing, you see three colors. And if you took that as a prescription for making colorings for knots, you would have to relax it a little bit to get something interesting. You would have to allow one color at a crossing as well as three, but then it becomes a nice rule. Three colors at a crossing or only one color at a crossing. And you would see that you could inherit that no matter what drawing you made of this knot by pushing it around, you could still color it and it would always have three colors. And that can be used to show that it's knotted. But I'm now wandering in the history of the matter. And 
Knots, of course, have a long and complex history. And Celtic knot tying um, goes back to around 800 AD uh, in, in the British Isles. And these beautiful patterns are interesting to contemplate, interesting to contemplate how they were designed. And in this book by Romilly Allen, which I didn't find out about until late in my life, um, it was written around 1900. Um, it, this uh, book was shown to me by David Evans, who's a statistical physicist. And he pointed out to me uh, the, this page, you see, and Romilly Allen's idea for classifying the Celtic knots. His idea is that you can understand that most of these patterns are produced from a regular weave, like the one on the right-hand side of the drawing, by smoothing the crossings. That's our term for it. I don't think it was his term, but the smoothing of a crossing is done by the diagram at the bottom of the page. You remove the crossing, you remove that bit of weave, and then you reconnect it in such a way that there is no crossing. And of course, there are two basic ways to reconnect it. You can reconnect it vertically, like I'm shown there, or horizontally, as is shown there. Two ways to put the, uh, uh, the ends of the rope together in such a way that the crossing is not there. I call them smoothings, two ways to smooth it or two ways to reconnect it. And then he pointed out that, well, look at uh, the Celtic knots and you see that um, they have been done by reconnection applied to a regular diagram. Well, this was very startling to me to see this because of the fact that prior to this for almost 10 years of the time when, when David showed me this, I had been working with a knot invariant that had come from the same idea. I had a similar idea of taking two reconnections and working with them, but not to design particular knots, but rather to create uh, an, an algorithm for computing things about knots. And in the algorithm, the two reconnections are added up with coefficients. And then you do this recursively and you can get topological information about the knot if you adjust the coefficients correctly. So this got discovered 83 years later and in the wake of um, certain other discoveries, such as the Jones polynomial, um, and turned out to be a very interesting non-invariant and is still being uh, investigated and turns out to have relationships with combinatorics and with statistical mechanics and quantum theory and many other things, such a simple thing. And that this simple thing is actually related to the designs of the Celtic knot tires is quite interesting. And what we're going to be talking about in this talk is reconnection. You'll see why. But if you were, and, and this talk is not about the uh, bracket polynomial or Jones polynomial, but I wanted to mention it because you can see from this blackboard here, how it goes, how one goes about getting information. One starts with the knot, one reconnects a crossing, one reconnects it the other way, one does it again, and one gets down to things where one knows how to calculate them already, things that are just made out of little curls, and then one puts all that together and gets a polynomial out. And, and then, as I say, with the right coefficients, the polynomial will not change when you move the knot around topologically. And so one can do things like prove that a trefoil knot is any equivalent to its mirror image and other things. So in this method, uh, the knot gets exfoliated into all of the different reconnections that can be made upon it. And those can be thought of as analogous to states in a partition function in statistical mechanics. And you sum over them to get the knot invariant. But we're going to talk about reconnection in a physical mode. We're going to talk about knotted vortices and how they tend to reconnect. And we're going to ask some questions about reconnection. So what you're looking at here is a picture of a knotted vortex in water. 
done by uh, Dustin Kleckner and William Irvine at the University of Chicago around, nine, around 2012. And they, in fact, are the first people to actually make a knotted vortex in a fluid. Um, the idea of a knotted vortex had been around for quite a long time. Um, it had been around since Lord Kelvin, because Lord Kelvin had the idea uh, that atoms, which were just beginning to be appreciated, were to be modeled by knotted vortices in the luminiferous ether. So three-dimensional knotted vortices should be atoms for Kelvin. And he began studying mathematically how vortices would behave. And he worried about the stability of the vortices, but he was sure that his theory was important and it became quite popular for a while until people started to criticize the ether. But here you have uh, a, a picture from an experiment of an actual knotted vortex, not in the luminiferous ether, but in water. And we'll talk about how that happens. Um, Kelvin drew pictures of some knots and uh, links and, and, uh, and that they might well represent atoms and so on. Um, other people um, who were thinking philosophically had the idea that uh, were struck by Kelvin's idea and felt that the knots were somehow going to be an intermediate between the spiritual world and the material world. And so you see drawings from other people than the scientists during this period. Just as these days we see people looking at quantum theory and thinking philosophically about it in many different modes. Um, the idea comes back in lots of papers. I'm only going to mention this one and the William Irvine paper, but there are lots of papers where the idea of, no, of a knotted uh, structure uh, in relation to physics is coming in. This one is very much a uh, speculation like Kelvin's due to Herbert Yela in the 1970s. He thought that it wasn't the luminiferous ether, it was the knotted quantized flux. And so he would have knotted quantized flux representing elementary particles and the trefoil was supposed to be a neutrino and uh, perhaps fibered knots were very important for this. Um, and, and he had the idea uh, of that, but he didn't have a, an analytic theory to back it up. You can think of it as a kind of precursor to string theory, but of course, as you know, string theory doesn't yet have ordinary three-dimensional knotting happening directly for it. It happens indirectly through conifold transition and other things. Anyway, let's go back over to Kleckner and Irvine. How did they make their knotted vortices? Well, you can blow a smoke ring or make an, an unknotted vortex by blowing water through a ring, of course, or through a hole. But another way of doing that is to take an object like this red uh, ribbon below and pull it quickly down through the water. And if you do that, then vortexing will happen along the, li the upper lip of the object and you will, get a, an un, you will get a vortex going out. So this is their method for making vortices. The cross section of the red ribbon is teardrop like that, which will enhance vortexing at the very edge of it, the lip of it, as I said. And vortexing means that the water will be swirling around the, swirling around the one dimensional uh, curve that comes up out of it. Now, once you, understand that you can make unknotted vortices that way, it might occur to you that you could make a knotted vortex if you used a knotted template. And that's exactly what they did. Instead of using an unknotted ribbon, they used a knotted ribbon, a knotted template, and they pull that quickly down through the water. And that produces, turns out after some tinkering, produces truffle knots and I presume they made some other knots as well. That's a movie of the production of an unknotted vortex by their method. And high speed photography to capture it because it tends to fall apart quite quickly. There's a still of it. 
um, what you just saw too quickly was the knotted template falling back and uh, the knotted vortex being photographed here. Since I did that for you without warning, let's go back one and watch the bottom of the screen. Down it goes and up comes <coughs> the knotted vortex. Now, as I said, these are very unstable and they tend to fall apart, but they fall apart, in fact, by reconnection, just as we were talking about. By reconnection that happens in the physical world, two bits of vortex come near one another and then the fluid flow makes a kind of chaotic transition in there and it comes back out reconnected. Now, I don't claim to understand this physical process. And what I'm going to do is take it as given and ask the question, how many reconnections do we need in order to unknot a knot? And this, of course, is what happens in the experiments as well, that you will see a certain number of reconnections and the knot becomes unknotted. How many do you need? Um, and and the auxiliary questions I want to learn about, but I don't know the answers. I don't know what promotes exactly the transition into the chaotic domain and then the coming back out into a, reg into a regularized domain. Again, the reconnection here is happening in a complex way. Not like the Celtic knot tires who would simply erase something and redraw it or the knot theorists who might do the same thing. Now, in fact, um, we, that is Kleckner and Irvine and myself, although I was more of a, just an, uh, a, a speaking consultant in this paper, we did a different kind of experiment. And this experiment involves looking at the evolution of a nonlinear Schrodinger equation where the vortex is a phase singularity line of the uh, solution to the Schrodinger equation, a place where the phase is not well determined. Um, and you can watch, so it is a nonlinear Schrodinger equation like the one I've drawn, I've given, indicated here on this slide. And the solution is written in the form of radial part times um, uh, e to the i um, phase. And if the phase becomes undetermined, you can have one dimensional undetermined phase singularities. And then those phase singularities will evolve in time. So you can start a vortex and watch it evolve in time. And you will see things like this happening in the computer modeling reconnection like that. So you can explore how many times the reconnection occurred. You can explore various initial conditions consisting in various knots and see what happens. Um, here's some stills. In this case, it was, in this case, it was simultaneously doing three reconnections at once, but how many do you really need to unknot the trefoil? Well, let's go back to drawings. Um, if you have the flow of the vortex going around the vortex line, you can indicate it by a little circular curve, which goes around in relation to an orientation on the vortex line given by the right-hand rule. Now you will notice that in the region between the two vortex lines, you will have the fluid flowing in the same direction away from the viewer. If one line uh, is oriented down and the other line is oriented up. Under those conditions, the fluid flow can become one fluid flow. And it is under those conditions that the reconnection can happen. So if you bring two vortex lines together with the wrong orientation, they will not reconnect. But if you bring them together with the right orientation, they can reconnect. If you are near a crossing, 
in a knot diagram, you see that there are places where a line is going in and another line is going out. And reconnection could occur right there. And I've indicated it diagrammatically. I have done a reconnection at a crossing. And you see that there's still a little bit of writhing in the, di in the, in the picture, a little twist there, but the reconnection has occurred. Then I've illustrated at the bottom of the slide, the trefoil knot and a reconnection with oppositely oriented edges. And we ended up still linked. We need to do one more over here. I did one more and now I'm unknotted. So you can see from this that it can be done in two reconnections. And it seems that you couldn't do it in less. And in fact, that's what we, I wanna explain how you can prove things like that, that you can't do it in less. But when I'm proving things like that, I'm just using a topological model, mind you. I am using the idea that we will allow reconnections when two um, arcs are oriented in the opposite direction. And then we will allow it to happen whenever two arcs come together and are opposite and oppositely oriented. And then we're asking, What's the least number of those do you need? It's a combinatorial topology question and doesn't need any more physics to for its uh, investigation at that stage. So we lift it off from the mysteries of the fluid flow and are asking a question about knots. What is the least number of reconnections needed to unknot a knot? This slide says what I just said. Here's an experiment. This is the knot 6-2. Oh, you'll see another picture of it in a moment. And here's an experiment of, the, with, of, the, of an evolution of the kind that we were doing. So you see it undergoing reconnections over there. And over on the right, the pictures of the corresponding topologies that occurred. It started out as the knot 6-2. Then it became a link. Then the link became a trefoil knot after another reconnection. Then the trefoil knot became a hop link after another reconnection, and then it became unknotted. So that's four reconnections. And you might wonder, well, is that the least number of reconnections that you need in order to undo 6-2? Well, let's behave. Uh, this is just another picture of what you saw before. I'll skip it. Um, and I wanna talk about the background idea that I'm going to be using here. This, this background idea is not necessary right now, but I think I will talk about it right now. You see that we could draw the world lines of the reconnections, if you wish to speak in physicist language, or if you wanna say it in a not theorist language, we can, write cobordisms that correspond to the reconnection evolutions. In other words, you start out with two arcs. Um, I guess time is going up the page. So you started out with those two parallel arcs on the upper right, upper left part of the diagram, and they came close together, and then they came apart into the two upper arcs. And at a certain point in time, there's a singularity, but it's just a simple touching of two curves. Yeah, the entire surface that is drawn out in space time is a saddle, a little saddle surface. The saddle could occur going upward or it could occur going downward. Those, that picture is a picture of how the world line of the vortex changes over time as it goes from one state to another. It's possible for, as I've illustrated here in the lower part of the slide, middle part of the slide, a circle could go through um, a reconnection and become two circles. And then you would have a bit of surface that looks like uh, two tubes going down to a waistband or two tubes going up to a waistband. And that looks like uh, shorts or pants. Um, you could have nothing happen. You could also have other things go on. And uh, from the point of view of the topologist or the person thinking about more general world lines, 
what some of the other things that can happen are illustrated here. You could have uh, a bit of surface suddenly born. So you're going along and there's a vacuum and then a point gives rise to a circle and the circle grows. Or you could have a circle getting smaller and smaller and disappearing. If it's unknotted, then we allow it. Those are called births and deaths. And you could also have other complicated things happen. Like you might have a circle and then the birth of a circle, and then the two would join by a reconnection and become a single circle. Or you could have a circle which gave birth to two, and then those two would join and give birth to one. And that, in fact, the one on the lower right is a schematic description of what happened with our trefoil knot, where we started with the trefoil and we went through a saddle and we ended up with two, the hop link, and then the hop link interacted with itself and became an unknotted circle. I recall it for you just so you see again what it is that I'm talking about. You can think of this trefoil knot as going through the saddle and now its world line took it up to two circles. The two circles are linked. Then an, another saddle occurred and the two circles became unlinked and became a single circle. So the cobordism story or world line story for this trefoil knot is what we we're looking at over here as a schema on the lower right. So I want to think about it that way because in topology, we have a framework that we have been studying, us topologists have been studying for a long time, uh, asking questions about surfaces in four space that might bound a knot in three space and properties of cobordisms. So here's what we were just talking about again. Um, here's the cobordism, the world line that starts at the top now, pardon me for reversing the time. And it goes through a saddle point, it goes through a reconnection and becomes two circles. The two circles are linked with one another. And then it goes through a saddle that brings the two circles back to one circle and it's unknotted. So that's the, framework in which I wish to think about these things. Now we can go back to 6.2. Here's a picture of 6.2. Uh, I see, let's see, we started at nine, so we have plenty of time. Um, um, here's a picture of 6.2, a diagram of 6.2. And, uh, and this is the sequence that you saw in the little movie. 6.2 underwent a saddle point, underwent a reconnection over here at the lower left-hand crossing. And that turned it into a link. And then that link underwent another reconnection and it went back to being a knot. And then it's a trefoil knot. And we know that we can undo the trefoil knot in two more reconnections. So that made for the four. And that was our question. Is this the least number for six two? Well, uh, it isn't. And the reason it isn't topologically is because of a basic fact that you can accomplish the switching of a crossing, change the weave from over to under in two reconnections. And I've illustrated how to do that here. If we had more time, I would tell you to do it as an exercise and come back. But here's the solution to getting the, the diagram to go from being woven this way to woven the other way, switch it underneath. What I do is I, as a topologist, I'm allowed to move things around. So I put a little twist that doesn't change the topological type. But now my little twist has an arrow going in the opposite direction from the arrow of the diagram. And so it can undergo uh, a reconnection right there. And now you see that the line of the diagram goes underneath. So we can pull it back and then we can push it back over. I'm allowed to do whatever I like as a topologist. I'm not worrying about whether it can happen physically in a flow. Um, and then I do a reconnection one more time and I end up with the weave switched and the little curl is still there. So the curl acted as a catalyst to switch the weave 
and we did it in two reconnections. But now you come back to, uh, 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 go back to 6-2. 6-2 can be undone by one crossing switch. That's a fact about it. There's the picture. You see, if you switch that crossing in the middle, it's on num knot already. So that means that you can undo switch, undo 6-2 with only two reconnections if you were clever enough to make it happen at the crossing. Would it, what would it look like if it was a physical process? You could imagine it looking something like this. Here's a picture of 6-2 with a little curl in it so that I could do my trick, all right? And then I did a reconnection near the curl, and then I pulled that back under and pushed it back over, and then I did a reconnection, and it's unknotted. So I only used for two reconnections. But I don't actually know a physical process in which this occurred. Maybe there's a way to give an initial condition to the gross piotrowski equation and have it happen there. Maybe not. We'd have to do the experiment. But now you see that there's a subtle topological question here. You might find that there's a way to do the reconnections in a certain number of steps, but what's the least number? How do you know when it's least? That's the topological question. So there are lower bounds. That's the thing. There are lower bounds, and I'm going to tell you about a couple of these lower bounds. So I let R of K be the least number of reconnections needed to transform a knot or link to a collection of unlinked circles or to an unknot. And there's a classical invariant called the signature of the knot. And that's a good one to start with. It turns out that the signature of the trefoil is minus two and that the signature of six two is also minus two. And that the signature, we can see that the signature is going to be a lower bound for the reconnection number, the absolute value of it. That's the result, that the absolute value of the signature is less than or equal to the reconnection number of the knot. Now, this follows from a fact known in classical knot theory that the signature of the knot is less than or equal to twice the genus of the knot in the four ball. That's the least genus surface that the knot can bound in a four ball, in a four dimensional ball. And why should genus be related to reconnection number? I think we should go back to a picture unless the forward slide has the picture I want. No, it doesn't. Let's go back to the world line. When you went through a reconnection once, and then again, you created a hole in the surface. That hole in the surface is what I mean by genus. Of course, there's a more <clears throat> technical definition of genus, but the number of holes in the surface is equal to its genus. And every time you create a hole, the least number of reconnections that can be involved in a hole is two. One saddle to begin the hole and one saddle to end the hole. So every time you see a, gene, a bit of genus, it means two reconnections. And if you knew that the genus had to be a certain number, then twice that would be, the, would be in, there would be that many reconnections involved, twice that. So that's why, if I happen to know a wonderful fact about the signature of the knot, excuse me, went through a lot of, oh, I, what did I do? No, I, yeah, I hit the button in the wrong direction, sorry. Let's, you get to review the talk up to that point, sorry. <laughs> Everything, right. <clears throat> A complete recapitulation. There we are. So I, I'm telling you that Murasugi proved many years ago that the signature of the knot is a lower bound on twice the genus of a surface in the four ball. And 
the surface in the four ball is our world line minus some uh, bits on the surface, but we want to know how many holes are in it. And uh, uh, Murasugi tells us that twice the number of holes in that surface is greater than or equal to the signature, but twice the number of holes is going to be less than or equal to the reconnection number. So we get a bound and we have thereby proved that the trefoil couldn't have been done in less than two and the 6-2 couldn't have been done in less than two. I'm going to skip telling you much about the signature, but it's worth telling you how simple it is um, in terms of information to get at the signature of a knot. What one does is one rewrites the knot as the boundary of a surface, and this can always be done. We're going to talk about how it's done in a moment anyway. And this is a very nice surface, uh, a disc with two twisted bands attached to it, whose boundary is a trefoil knot. And then you look at the basic curves on the surface, and you look at how they link with one another if you push them slightly off the surface from one another, and you form a matrix of these linking numbers. It's not symmetric. And then you symmetrize it by adding it to its complement, adding it to its transpose, and you take the signature of that matrix, and that's the signature of the knot. So that's uh, not such a hard thing to extract from the knot. But how do you get surfaces whose boundary is the knot? We're going to see that they're important for thinking about reconnection numbers, so bear with us. Here's the trefoil knot, and here are two smoothings of the trefoil knot of a kind that we would not normally allow for the physical problem. So uh, I speak of reconnection when the uh, orientation of the lines is opposite, but I speak of smoothing more generally, and these are oriented smoothings. And if I perform oriented smoothings on my trefoil knot, I get some circles. And Seifert in the 1930s had this beautiful idea. He said, smooth the crossings, get some circles, bound the circles with disks, put the crossings back by little twisted bands and glue it together and you will have a surface whose boundary is the knot, just like I see here. The outer disc, I didn't draw all of it. It goes out and comes up over like a dome, perhaps. But that's Seifert's method for producing a surface whose boundary is the knot. Okay? We're going to use it. We're going to think about it in terms of reconnection. Because you see, the way we were reconnecting also produces Seifert circles with little curly bits on them. You see it right there over on the right hand top of the slide. I did the, the reconnections and I got two circles, the separate circles. Only at every crossing, I didn't eliminate it, I got a little curl. So in the world line, the knot went from being the knot over to this collection of circles. So somehow you see the world line of that knot is related to the Seifert surface. And in fact, what it's showing you is that the classical knot diagram bounds a surface in the four ball, and the surface in the four ball is actually equal to the genus of the Seifert surface. All you have to do is go through this world line, the reconnect, the maximal reconnection world line, and then bound off all those disks with all those circles with disks into the four ball, and you obtain a surface that's exactly the same as Seifert's surface, but it's embedded into four space instead of three space. And so we want to know what is the genus of the Seifert surface. And there's a very pretty formula for the genus of the Seifert surface. I won't prove it. It's proved by thinking about Euler's formula about vertices, edges, and faces on a surface. But the formula is that the genus is equal to one half of the following calculation. You consider the number of crossings, you subtract the number of ciphered circles, and you add one. 
So you can see how it went here. The number of crossings is three. The number of ciphered circles is two. Subtract two from three and you get one. You add one, you get two. Divide by two and you get one. And this, in fact, is of genus one. This is actually a torus. And it's that toral surface that I had back a little ways. I should have drawn a nice deformation between this ciphered surface and the, I'm going back to show it to you. Oh, I didn't go back. Why didn't I go back? Because I didn't. Uh, that surface there, that's of genus one. Um, but Mm, uh, I'm just going to tell you that it's of genus one since I didn't draw pictures of how it's of genus one. All right. So what you should remember though is that the genus of the ciphered spanning surface is equal to this number, the number of crossings minus the number of ciphered circles plus one divided by two. And, and that means that um, that's related to reconnection number since reconnection number is related to twice genus, as we said. Now, I'm going to skip this slide, which has to do with links. And we'll just start with this slide. So here's, here's a more powerful theorem. <coughs> Suppose I have a positive link. And a positive link means that every crossing in the link is positive, which means that if you put the fingers of your right hand along the overcrossing direction, your thumb would point in the direction of the undercrossing line. All the crossings in this diagram are positive. It means that if you wrapped your hand around the link, around the knot in the direction of the overcrossing line, you would be putting your thumb in the direction of the undercrossing line. So crossings are either positive or negative, and we can assume they're all positive. Many non-trivial knots are positive knots and links. So if you have a positive link, then the genus in the four ball is actually equal to the ciphered genus, the one I just told you about. And thus, if K is a positive diagram, then the reconnection number of it is greater than or equal to twice the four ball genus, and that's equal to number of crossings minus number of ciphered circles plus one. That's, now we prove this by using Rasmussen's invariant. And if we had more time, I would explain how Rasmussen's invariant works. But for now, we'll just give it the name. Rasmussen's invariant implies this. And now I wanna do a, a construction to show you that it's actually equal. So what we're going to do is prove that the reconnection number for a positive link is actually equal to that number. It's equal to the lower bound. It's equal to the number of crossings minus the number of ciphered circles plus one. Well, what do we have to do? We have to actually undo it by reconnections with exactly that number of reconnections. If we can do that, we're done because that's the least number it could be, right? It's greater than or equal to that. So all we have to do is realize it and we're done. Now it's done in text here, but I wanna show you the picture. So here's a positive link. And just to the right of it are all the ciphered circles. And if we did a, if we did a reconnection at every single crossing, we would arrive at the ciphered circles, as we said before. But I don't want all the ciphered circles, I just want an unknot. And so I'm only going to reconnect at the places in, the, I would like to point, so I'll, I'll get out of here. I, I'm going to just reconnect here, 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 and here. And I'm not going to reconnect at these points. And I'm going to get this. And now I want you to stare at that for a moment and realize that it is indeed unknotted. That's the first part of our exercise. You see it? It is unknotted. You can untwist this and untwist that and then untwist this and all this twistiness goes away. And then 
you're left with another twist here and you can undo that, it's all gone. So I, in this example, I got down to the unknot, not by doing all the reconnections, but by doing one, two, three, four, five, six of them. And six is equal to 10 minus five plus one. So I illustrated the theorem, but how did I know what to do? Well, here's how I know what to do. I form all the ciphered circles, and then I say, well, I don't want to do all the connections that broke you into ciphered circles. I'm going to make a chain of ciphered circles in a tree-like form that connects them back up. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to reconnect here so that these are connected to one another. I'm not going to reconnect here so that these are connected. So this one and this one, but they're in a tree-like form. They're going to be, it would be a tree in general, a tree of loops. And if you go out to the fringes of the tree, if you go out to the twigs in the tree, each loop will untwist, just like this one untwisted, this one untwisted, then this one would untwist, then this one would untwist, then this next big one will untwist. So that if I use, uh, if I connect the cipher circles all together into one circuit like that, then I will get an unknot. And how many, how many reconnections should I not do then? One less than the number of ciphered circles. In this case, there are five ciphered circles and I need four of these to make the connections between them. So that's why total number of crossings minus one less than the number of ciphered circles. So by taking total number of crossings minus one less than the number of ciphered circles, I can reconnect the knot into an, reconnect it into an unknot. And that's what I wanted to do. So that's the proof of that lemma. So we have proved we have proved that if K is a positive link, then we actually know its reconnection number. Its reconnection number is given by that formula. So, so at this point, it would be good to do more experiments. I haven't had access to that recently um, to find out uh, about various examples because we know the least number and we can find out what happens in one form of physics or another of the situation. Um, you might want to look at some other examples. Here's a link and um, we get, it's a positive link and we get that the reconnection number is two. And we can see indeed that it is two if you follow my procedure, but if you do it in the wrong way, it might come out larger. Like it might seem quite natural to do a reconnection right in the middle, but then you'd get these two hop links and each of them requires one more and you would require get three. So, uh, so you see that in one case, the world line looks like this uh, guy in the upper right, and only has two saddles. And in the other case, the world line is more complicated. Or another example is the torus knot of type PQ. There's a nice big family of positive links, positive knots. And uh, if you do the calculation, you find out that twice the ciphered genus of the torus knot is P minus one times Q minus one. So, um, this is related to Rasmussen's invariant also. Um, it's a famous example in relation to Rasmussen, but for our purposes, it's telling us that if you want to do a reconnection of the torus knot to get the unknot, you're going to need P minus one times Q minus one reconnections for a torus knot of type PQ. PQ means that it goes around a torus P times one in one direction in the meridional direction and Q times in the longitudinal direction. Many examples here. Um, not all reconnections, of course, lead to the production of a genus. You could have a knot like this one, uh, where I've shown you that it bounds a simple disc, no genus, in the four ball. Um, you can see the disc in the four ball by understanding that the colorful disc that you see in this picture has some self-intersections but 
those self-intersections are avoided by pushing the surface into four space. So in this case, um, there is a reconnection number, but there isn't any genus that's produced. Reconnection number is one in this case, and you can see other things about it. Many questions you can ask. Um, people think about cascades of reconnection that may take you to the unknot and wondering what's the least length of cascade. And as I say, our formula here should be of use in thinking about formula about experiments with things like this. So that's the story up to this point. Um, we know the reconnection numbers for positive knots and maybe some others if we think about it carefully. And um, eventually there should be experimental results related to this. Time will tell. Now, I have a few minutes and I wanted to show you a phenomenon that's in my slideshow, but my slideshow contains the background to Rasmussen's invariant at this point, which is a little too long to go into for this time. So I'm going to skip across it. And also some stories about how to generalize these results because you can generalize the results I just talked about and the questions about uh, reconnection to virtual knots. Virtual knots are knots that are embedded in thickened surfaces, and it's still a physical question. It would be a physical question of vortices under constraints to stay in a certain space. But I want to show you this part. We're going to see an experiment by Professor Alexienko um, uh, in Novosibirsk, um, who showed that in another vortex situation, the topology could become more complicated. Reconnection could actually produce a more complex topological situation. In his experiment, you're going to see what I've diagrammed here. You're going to see a vortex line slide upward a bit, undergo reconnection, and produce a link. So this shows that in some physical situations, it isn't necessarily just falling into unlinks. And we'd like to know more about that too. So um, first, here's a film. Now, now you've got the feel of it. It's a turbine. He's experimenting with a turbine. The turbine is wider at the bottom than it is at the top. The water is just being made to rotate, rotate, and you get a, a line vortex which can change its shape some uh, due to the geometry of the situation um, and even move upward. And that's what you're watching. Uh, and at the very end of the movie here, you're seeing that sliding up and forming the link, but it's too fast, of course. So I've given us some stills. Here is what it looked like near the end of the movie where the line is coming up and then it went underneath. Now that really did go underneath. This the, it went underneath there, goes under and then under again, and then moving up a little bit, moving up a bit more, over on the left, those two lines are getting close to one another. And if you would check the orientations, you realize that coming down from the top, you could put a down arrow and then follow the arrow around. And then the part that's coming up has an up arrow. So those two parts that are getting close to one another are in a position to interact. The flow will go between them. And they do interact and reconnect. And now you see the link. So from here, unlinked and about to reconnect to here, linked. So that's what happened in Alexienko's experiment and a link got produced. I am wondering and meaning to write to him whether or not could get produced. Why not? You can imagine a version of what you just saw that would produce a knot, it would look like this. Two loops in the 
vortex on another loop. And the loops come together and undergo a reconnection like you saw before. And then there's still another curl. And that one undergoes a reconnection and bingo, you'd have a trephone arm. So it's not, um, it's not implausible that an experiment of this type could produce a knotted vortex. Uh, but I don't know if that has happened or that it might happen. But that's a good place to end uh, this talk with that speculation, I think. Um, as you see, there are many questions. Um, some of the mathematics that I put under the hood in this talk, the Rasmussen invariant, comes from making, uh, a, uh, making a homology theory due to Kovanov that is related to the bracket polynomial, the Jones polynomial that I mentioned in the beginning, so that the topology goes in a continuous and rather a sophisticated line in back of this up through that cohomology theory, and then estimates related to it that allowed one to prove things about four ball genus. Um, and that is what the topology looks like in the background. And uh, it's quite fascinating that that sophisticated topology can actually talk to some things that are happening in the physical world with vortices. So altogether, um, I'm quite fascinated by this interaction and would be very interested in your reactions to it. I'll stop here. Thank you.